While I drove, she sat up alertly and stared out her window, watching the houses race past us. I could see that she was nervous, but I also guessed that she was curious. Once it was clear we were not going to stop at any given house, she lost all interest in it and looked to the next. I wondered how she pictured my home. As we left the town behind us, she seemed to get more apprehensive. She glanced at me a few times, as if she wanted to ask a question, but when she caught me looking at her, she turned back to the window quickly, her ponytail whipping out behind her. Her toes started tapping against the floor of the truck cab, though I hadn't put the radio on. When I turned onto the drive, she sat up straighter, and then her knee was bouncing in time with her toes. Her fingers pressed so tightly against the window frame that their tips turned white. As the drive wound on and on, she started to frown. And truly, it did look like we were headed somewhere just as remote and uninhabited as the meadow. The stress mark appeared between her brows. I reached out and brushed her shoulder and she gave me a strained smile before turning to the window again. Finally, the drive broke through the last fringe of the forest and onto the lawn. Still, in the shade of the big cedars, it didn't feel like an abrupt change. It was odd to look at the familiar house and try to imagine how it would appear to new eyes. Esme had excellent taste, so I knew the house was objectively beautiful. But would Bella see a structure that was trapped in time, that belonged to another era, yet was clearly new and strong? As if we'd traveled backward in time to find it, rather than it aging forward to us? Wow, she breathed. I cut the engine and the following silence strengthened the impression that we could be in another part of history. You like it? I asked. She glanced at me from the corner of her eye, then looked back to the house. It has a certain charm. I laughed and tweaked her ponytail, then slid out of the car. Less than a second passed, and I was holding her door open for her. Ready? Not even a little bit. She laughed, breathless. Let's go. She ran a hand over her hair, searching for tangles. You look lovely. I assured her and took her hand. Her palm was moist and not as warm as usual. I rubbed the back of her hand with my thumb, trying to communicate without words that she was perfectly safe and everything would be fine. She started to slow as we walked up the porch steps and her hand was trembling. Hesitating would only prolong her unease. I opened the door, already knowing exactly what was on the other side. My parents were just where their thoughts had placed them in my mind's eye, and just as Alice had envisioned them, they stood back half a dozen paces from the door, giving Bella some breathing space. Esme was as nervous as Bella seemed to be, though for her, that meant perfect stillness rather than Bella's agitation. Carlyle's hand rested on the small of her back in a comforting fashion. He was used to interacting with humans casually, but Esme was shy. It was rare that she ventured out alone to mix with the mortal world. A true home buddy. She was quite happy to let the rest of us bring the world back to her as needed. Bella's eyes darted around the room taking it in. She was slightly behind me, as if using my body as a shield. I couldn't help but feel relaxed inside my home, though I knew it was the opposite for her. I squeezed her hand. Carlyle smiled warmly at Bella, and Esme quickly followed suit. Carlyle, Esme, this is Bella. I wondered whether Bella heard the note of pride in my voice as I introduced her. Carlyle moved forward with deliberate slowness. He held out his hand, a little tentative. You're very welcome, Bella. 
Perhaps because she already knew Carlisle, Bella seemed suddenly more comfortable. Looking confident, she stepped forward to meet his advance, while not untangling her fingers from mine, and shook his offered hand without even a wince at the chill. Of course, she was surely used to that by now. It's nice to see you again, Dr. Colin, she said, sounding like she really meant it. Such a brave girl, Esme thought. Oh, she's darling. Please, call me Carlisle. Bella beamed. Carlisle, she repeated. Esme joined Carlisle then, moving in the same slow, careful way. She placed one hand on Carlisle's arm and extended the other. Bella took it without hesitation, smiling at my mother. It's very nice to know you, Esme said, affection radiating from her smile. Thank you, Bella said. I'm glad to meet you, too. Though the words were conventional enough on both sides, they both spoke with such earnestness that the exchange carried a deeper significance. I adore her, Edward. Thank you for bringing her to see me. I could only smile at Esme's enthusiasm. Where are Alice and Jasper? I asked, but it was more of a prompt. I could hear them waiting at the top of the stairs, Alice timing her perfect entrance. My question seemed to be what she was waiting for. Hey, Edward, she called as she darted into view. Then she ran, really ran, not in a human way, down the steps and hurled to a stop just inches from Bella. Carlisle Esme and I all froze in surprise, but Bella didn't so much as flinch, even when Alice sprang forward to kiss her cheek. I shot her a warning look, but Alice wasn't paying any attention to me. She was living halfway between this moment and a thousand future moments, exulting and finally getting to begin her friendship. Her feelings were very sweet, but I couldn't enjoy them. More than half of her yet-to-be memories featured the white, lifeless Bella, so flawless and so cold. Alice was oblivious to my reaction, focused on Bella. You do smell nice. She commented. I never noticed before. Bella blushed and all three of them looked away. I tried to think of a way to ease the awkwardness. But then, like magic, there was no awkwardness. I was perfectly comfortable. And I could feel Bella's tension melt out of her body. Jasper followed Alice down the stairs. Not racing, but not moving cautiously like Carlisle and Esme either. There was no need for him to put on a show. Everything he did seemed natural and right. In truth, he was laying it on a little thick. I gave him a sardonic look, and he grinned at me, then stopped by the newel post, leaving what might have felt like an odd distance between himself and the rest of us. But of course, it couldn't feel odd if he didn't want it to. Hello, Bella. Hello, Jasper. She smiled easily, then looked at Esme and Carlisle. It's nice to meet you all. You have a very beautiful home. Thank you, Esme answered. We're so glad that you came. She's perfect. Bella glanced at the stairs again, expectant, but I knew there would not be any more introductions this morning. Esme understood the look as well. I'm sorry. She wasn't ready. Emma's trying to calm her down. Should I make excuses for Rosalie? Before I could decide what to say, Carlyle caught my attention. Edward. I looked at him automatically. His intensity contrasted with the easy mood Jasper had created. Alice saw some visitors. Strangers. At the rate they're moving, they'll find us tomorrow night. I thought you should know immediately. I nodded once, my lips pressing into a thin line, 
What miserable timing. Well, I suppose the silver lining was that I was now free to explain to Bella why I was kidnapping her. She would understand. Charlie wouldn't. I'd have to figure out the safest, least disruptive plan. Or rather, we would. She would certainly have opinions. I looked at Alice for a visual clarification, but she was thinking about the weather. Do you play? Esme asked, and I glanced over to see that Bella was eyeing my piano. Bella shook her head. Not at all, but it's so beautiful. Is it yours? Esme laughed. No, Edward didn't tell you he was musical? Bella gave me the strangest look, as if this news was irritating. I wondered why. Did she have a yet undiscovered prejudice against pianists? No, she answered Esme. I should have known, I guess. What does she mean, Edward? Esme wondered, as if I would know the answer. Luckily, her expression was confused enough to compel Bella to explain. Edward can do everything, Bella clarified. Right? Carlyle repressed his amusement, but Jasper laughed out loud. Alice was watching the conversation that would happen 20 seconds from now. This was old news to her. Esme gave me her best disapproving mother look. I hope you haven't been showing off. It's rude. Just a bit, I admitted, laughing too. He looks so happy, Esme thought. I've never seen him this way. Thank goodness he found her at last. He's been too modest, actually, Bella disagreed. Her eyes flickered to the piano again. Well, play for her, Esme encouraged. I shot my mother a betrayed look. You just said showing off was rude. Esme was holding back a laugh of her own. There are exceptions to every rule. If she's not totally hooked yet, that should do it. I stared back, deadpan. I'd like to hear you play, Bella volunteered. It's settled then. Esme put her hand on my shoulder and nudged me toward the piano. Fine, if that's what they wanted. I kept Bella's hand so she would have to join me. This was her idea, after all. I'd never been self-conscious about my music before. There was never anybody but family or close friends around to hear me. And besides Esme, most of them barely seemed to notice I was playing. So this was a new feeling. Maybe if Esme hadn't mentioned showing off before, it wouldn't have felt so forced. I sat on the bench off center, pulling Bella down to sit beside me. She smiled at me eagerly. I stared back at her, frowning, hoping she recognized that I was only doing this because she asked. I chose Esme's song. It was a joyful song, a triumphant song, suited to the day's mood. As I began, I watched Bella's reaction from the corner of my eye. I didn't need to look at the keys, but I didn't want to make her feel scrutinized. After just the first few measures, her mouth fell open. Jasper laughed again. This time Alice joined him. Bella stiffened, but didn't turn. Her eyes narrowed, her gaze never leaving my fingers chasing them as they moved across the keys. I heard Alice skip to the stairs at the same time that Carlyle thought, Well, that's probably enough of us for now. We don't want to overwhelm her. Esme was disappointed, but she followed Alice upstairs. They would all pretend that this was just a normal day, that it was nothing momentous to have a human inside our house. One by one, they flitted away to the task they would have been pursuing if I hadn't brought the mortal home. Bella was still entirely focused on the motion of my hands, but I thought she was not. 
as eager as before. Her brows were pressing down over her eyes. I didn't understand her expression. I tried to cheer her, turning my head to catch her attention and winking once. That usually made her smile. Do you like it? I asked. Her head tilted to the side, and then something seemed to occur to her. Her eyes grew huge again. You wrote this? She said, her tone strangely accusatory. I nodded and added, It's Esme's favorite, like an apology, though I wasn't sure what I was trying to excuse. Bella stared at me, strangely forlorn, her eyes closed, and her head rocked slowly from side to side. What's wrong? I implored. She opened her eyes and finally smiled, but it wasn't a happy smile. I'm feeling extremely insignificant, she admitted. I was stunned for a moment. I supposed Esme's earlier words about showing off were the crux of the matter. Her idea that my music would win over whichever corners of Bella's heart remained ambivalent was obviously misguided. How to explain that all these things I could do, things that came with such ridiculous ease because of what I was, were entirely meaningless. They didn't make me special or superior. How to show her that everything I was had never been enough to make me worthy of her. That she was the lofty goal I'd been trying to reach for so long. I could only think of one way. I created a simple bridge and shifted into a new song. She watched my expression now, expecting me to respond. I waited until I was through the main structure of the melody, hoping she would recognize it. You inspired this one, I murmured. Could she feel how this music came from the very core of my being? And that my core, along with everything else I was, centered wholly on her? For a few moments... I let the notes of the song fill in the spaces that my words never quite could. The melody expanded as I played, drifting away from its former minor key, reaching now for a happier resolution. I thought I should allay her earlier fears. They like you, you know, as may especially. Bella had probably been able to see that herself. She twisted to peek over my shoulder. Where did they go? Very subtly giving us some privacy, I suppose. They like me, she groaned. But Rosalie and Emmett. I shook my head impatiently. Don't worry about Rosalie. She'll come around. She pursed her lips, unconvinced. Emmett? Well, he thinks I'm a lunatic. It's true. I laughed once. But he doesn't have a problem with you. He's trying to reason with Rosalie. The corners of her lips pulled down. What is it that upsets her? I took a breath and exhaled slowly, stalling. I wanted to say only the most necessary parts and say them in the least upsetting way. Rosalie struggles the most with with what we are. I explained. It's hard for her to have someone on the outside know the truth. And she's a little jealous. Rosalie is jealous of me? She looked as though she wasn't sure whether I was joking. I shrugged. You're human. She wishes that she were, too. Oh, that revelation stunned her for a moment, but then the frown returned. Even Jasper, though. The sense that everything was perfectly natural and easy had faded as soon as Jasper had stopped concentrating on us. I imagined she was remembering his introduction without that influence, 
and seeing for the first time the strangeness of the wide space he had left between them. That's really my fault. I told you, he was the most recent to try our way of life. I warned him to keep his distance. I'd said the words lightly, but after a second, Bella shivered. Esme and Carlisle? She asked quickly, as if eager for a new subject. Are happy to see me happy. Actually, Esme wouldn't care if you had a third eye and webbed feet. All this time, she'd been worried about me, afraid that there was something missing from my essential makeup, that I was too young when Carlisle had changed me. She's ecstatic. Every time I touch you, she just about chokes with satisfaction. She pursed her lips. Alice seems very... enthusiastic. I tried to keep my composure, but I heard the edge of ice in my answer. Alice has her own way of looking at things. Her aspect had been tense for most of our exchange, but suddenly she was grinning. And you're not going to explain that, are you? Of course she noticed all my strange reactions to any mention of Alice. I'd not been very subtle. At least she was smiling now, pleased to catch me out. I was sure she had no idea why I was irritated with Alice. Just letting me know that she knew that I was keeping something from her seemed to be enough for her now. I didn't respond, but I didn't think she was expecting me to. So what was Carlyle telling you before? She asked. I frowned. You noticed that, did you? Well, I knew I needed to tell her this. Of course. I thought of that little shudder when I explained about Jasper. I hated to alarm her again, but she should be frightened. He wanted to tell me some news, I admitted. He didn't know if it was something I would share with you. She sat up, straighter, alert. Will you? I have to, because I'm going to be a little overbearingly protective over the next few days or weeks, and I wouldn't want you to think I'm naturally a tyrant. My trivializing did not put her at ease. What's wrong? She demanded. Nothing's wrong, exactly. Alice just sees some visitors coming soon. They know we're here, and they're curious. She repeated my words in a whisper. Visitors? Yes. Well, they aren't like us, of course. In their hunting habits, I mean. They probably won't come into town at all, but I'm certainly not going to let you out of my sight till they're gone. She shuddered so hard I could feel the motion in the bench beneath us. Finally, a rational response, I muttered. I thought of all the horrifying things she'd accepted about me without a tremor. Only other vampires were scary, apparently. I was beginning to think you had no sense of self-preservation at all. She ignored that and started to watch my hands moving over the keys again. After a few seconds, she took a deep breath and slowly exhaled. Had she processed another waking nightmare so easily? It seemed so. She examined the room now, her head turning slowly as she scrutinized my home. I could imagine what she was thinking. Not what you expected, is it? I guessed. She was still cataloging with her eyes. No. I wondered what had surprised her most. The light colors? The vast openness of the space? The wall of windows? It was all very carefully designed by Esme. Not to feel like some kind of fortress or asylum. I could hazard what a normal human would have predicted. 
No coffins, no piled skulls in the corners. I don't even think we have cobwebs. What a disappointment this must be for you. She didn't react to my joke. It's so light, so open. It's the one place we never have to hide. While I'd been focused on her, the song I was playing had strayed back to its roots. I found myself in the middle of the bleakest moment, the moment when the obvious truth was unavoidable. Bella was perfect as she was. Any interference from my world was a tragedy. It was too late to save the song. I let it end as it had before with that heartbreak. Sometimes it was so easy to believe that Bella and I were right together. In the moment when impulsivity led and everything came so naturally, I could believe. But whenever I looked at it logically, without allowing emotion to trump reason, it was clear that I could only hurt her. Thank you, she whispered. Her eyes were swimming in tears. While I watched, she quickly wiped her fingers across her lower lids, rubbing the moisture away. This was the second time I'd seen Bella cry. The first time I'd hurt her. Not intentionally, but still. By implying we could never be together, I'd caused her pain. Now she cried because the music I'd created for her had touched her. Tears caused by pleasure. I wondered how much of this unspoken language she had understood. One tear still glistened in the corner of her left eye, shining in the brightness of the room. A tiny clear piece of her, an ephemeral diamond. Acting on some strange instinct, I reached out to catch it with my fingertip. Round on my skin, it sparkled as my hand moved. I swiftly touched my finger to my tongue, tasting her tear, absorbing this minute particle of her. Carlyle had spent many years attempting to understand our immortal anatomy. It was a difficult task, based mostly on assumption and observation. Vampire cadavers were not available for study. His best interpretation of our life systems was that our internal workings must be microscopically porous. Though we could swallow anything, only blood was accepted by our bodies. That blood was absorbed into our muscles and provided fuel. When the fuel was depleted, our thirst intensified to encourage us to replenish our supply. Nothing besides blood seemed to move through us at all. I swallowed Bella's tear. Perhaps it would never leave my body. After she left me, after all the lonely years had passed, maybe I would always have this piece of her inside me. She stared at me curiously, but I had no sane way to explain. Instead, I returned to her earlier curiosity. Do you want to see the rest of the house? I offered. No coffins? She double-checked. I laughed and stood, pulling her up from the piano bench. No coffins. I led her upstairs to the second floor. She'd seen most of the first. All but the unused kitchen and the dining room were visible from the front door. As we climbed, her interest was evident. She studied everything, the railing, the pale wood floors, the picture frame paneling that lined the hallway at the top. It was like she was preparing for an exam. I named the owner of each room we passed, and she nodded after each designation, ready for the quiz. I was about to round the corner and follow the next flight of stairs up, but Bella stopped suddenly. I looked to see what she was staring at so bemusedly. Ah. You can laugh, I said. It is sort of ironic. She didn't laugh. She stretched out her hand as if she wished to touch the thick oak cross that hung there, dark and somber 
against the lighter wood behind it, but her fingertips didn't make contact. It must be very old, Bella murmured. I shrugged. Early 1630s, more or less. She stared up at me, her head tilted to one side. Why do you keep this here? Nostalgia. It belonged to Carlyle's father. He collected antiques, she suggested, sounding as if she already knew her guess was wrong. No, I answered. He carved this himself. It hung on the wall above the pulpit in the vicarage where he preached. Bella looked up at the cross, her stare intense. She didn't move for so long that I started to get anxious again. Are you all right? I murmured. How old is Carlyle? She shot back. I sighed, trying to quell the old panic. Would this story be the one that would be too much? I scrutinized every minute muscle twitch in her face as I explained. He just celebrated his 362nd birthday. Or close enough. Carla had chosen a day for Esme's sake, but it was only his best guess. Carla was born in London in the 1640s, he believes. Time wasn't marked as accurately then, for the common people anyway. It was just before Cromwell's rule, though. He was the only son of an Anglican pastor. His mother died giving birth to him. His father was an intolerant man. As the Protestants came into power, he was enthusiastic in his persecution of Roman Catholics and other religions. He also believed very strongly in the reality of evil. He led hunts for witches, werewolves, and vampires. She'd been keeping up a good charade for the most part, almost as if she were dissociating from the facts. But when I spoke the word vampires, her shoulders stiffened and she held her breath for an extra second. They burned a lot of innocent people. Of course, the real creatures that he sought were not so easy to catch. This still haunted Carlyle. The innocents his father had murdered. And even more, those murders Carlyle had been unwillingly involved in. I was glad for his sake that the memories were blurred and always fading more. I knew the stories of Carlyle's human years as well as I knew my own. As I described his ill-fated discovery of an ancient London coven, I wondered if this would sound real to her at all. This was irrelevant history, set in a country she'd never seen, separated from her own existence by so many years that she had no context for it. She seemed spellbound, though, as I described the attack that had infected Carlyle and killed his associates. Carefully leaving out the details, I'd rather she didn't dwell on. When the vampire, driven by thirst, had wheeled around and fallen on his pursuers, he'd only slash Carlyle twice with his venom-covered teeth, once across the palm of his outstretched hand and once through his bicep. It had been a melee, the vampire struggling to quickly subdue four men before the rest of the mob got too close. After the fact, Carlyle had theorized that the vampire was hoping to drain them all, but he chose self-preservation over a more bounteous meal, grabbing the men he could carry and running. It was not self-preservation from the mob, of course. Those fifty men with their crude weapons were no more dangerous to him than a kaleidoscope of butterflies. However, the Voltori were less than a thousand miles away. Their laws had been established for a millennium by this point, and their demand that every immortal exercise discretion for the benefit of all was universally accepted. The story of a vampire sighting in London attested to by 50 witnesses with drained corpses as proof, would not have gone over well in Volterra. The nature of Carlyle's wounds was unfortunate. The gash in his hand was far from any major vessels. The slash in his arm had missed both the brachial artery and the basilic vein. 
This meant a much slower spread of the venom and a longer transition period. As the conversion from mortal to immortal was the most painful thing any of us had ever experienced, an extended version was not ideal, to say the least. I'd known the pain of that same extended version. Carlisle had been unsure when he decided to change me into his first companion. He'd spent a great deal of time with other, more experienced vampires, the Voltori included, and he knew that a better placed bite would result in a quicker conversion. However, he'd never found another vampire like himself. All the others were obsessed with blood and power. No one else craved a kinder, more familial life as he did. He wondered whether his slow conversion and the weak entry points of his infection had been somehow responsible for the difference. So when creating his first son, he chose to imitate his own wounds. He always felt bad about that, especially as he later found that the method of conversion actually had no bearing on the personality and desires of the new immortal. He hadn't had time to experiment when he found Esme. She was much closer to death than I had been. To save her, it had been imperative to get as much venom into her system as close to her heart as possible. All in all, a much more frenzied effort than it had been with me. And yet, Esme was the gentlest of us all. And Carlyle the strongest. I now told Bella what I could about his extraordinarily disciplined conversion. I found myself editing things that perhaps I shouldn't have, but I didn't want to dwell on Carlyle's excruciating pain. Maybe, given her obvious curiosity about the process, it would have been a good thing to describe. Perhaps it would have deterred her from wanting to know more. It was over, then. I explained, and he realized what he had become. All the while, lost in my own thoughts as I told the familiar tale, I'd been observing her reactions. For the most part, she kept the same expression fixed on her face. I think she meant it to look like a tentative interest, totally devoid of any unnecessary emotional recoils. However, she held herself too stiffly for her ploy to be believable. Her curiosity was real, but I wanted to know what she really thought, not what she wanted me to think she thought. How are you feeling? I asked. I'm fine, she answered automatically, but her mask slipped a little bit. Still, all I could read on her face was a desire to know more so this story hadn't been enough to frighten her away. I expect you have a few more questions for me. She grinned, totally self-possessed, seemingly fearless. A few. I smiled back. Come on then, I'll show you.